Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. Blessed are we who have been led by the saints. Thank God for all who accompany us along the way. Lord, we thank you for our faith and assistance. Blessed are we who have experienced Christ in another. Thank God for all who reflect the love of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for faithful disciples of Jesus. Blessed are we who know Jesus lives today. Thank God for all who served in his name. We praise you for all who said yes to your call to love, teach, and serve. May our time of worship and honor you and live as the saints. For all those who labored faithfully for peace, justice, and your kingdom here on earth. We thank you. Amen. Please turn to page 700 and 11 in the United Methodist Hymnal for our opening hymn, For All the Saints, verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. Please be seated. This morning we honor the members and family and friends of our church that have passed away in the past year. Um, if you're coming to light a candle, I will announce the name and you'll get the light from Gary to um, light the candle for your loved one. Once we're finished with the members and friends who have passed in the past year, we invite everyone to come up and light any candle that they wish. Um, there'll be a microphone here for you to uh, announce the name.
John Demerit. John Gray. Virginia Hayward. Cindy Johnson. E.J. Johnson. Brenda Keltner. Reverend Dr. Lyle Linder. Ruth Karsh, Karsher, excuse me. Beverly Phillips. Joe Quior. Martha Wainwright. Rita Walsh. Reverend Richard Weiborg. Eunice Yost. If you'd like to light a candle for one of the saints in your life, please feel free to come forward at this time.
three, two for Carol Chase, if you could bring the roses to her, for Priscilla and Richard Elves. for my mom-in-law, Mary Watts. For my um, brother-in-law's father, Lawrence Verbos. My grandmother, Jean Amadeo. My husband, Carrie Wilson. I'd like to play two, one for my mother, Dorothy Oliver, and another for my great aunt Anne, the last of her generation, who passed at 104. For Liliana Renee Deza, who at our funeral on Friday would have turned three weeks old. For my husband, Dick Coombs, and for my cousin, Robert Nickerson, My father, Pastor Alton Thompson, and a colleague of mine, uh, Bruce Pratt, who will actually be memorialized at the Watertown Church next week. For Douglas Clement, a dear neighbor and family friend. For Mary Mahoney, a dear friend. This was for Joe Devaney. I'd like to light two candles, one for my mother, Margaret Keltner, and one for my father, Gail Keltner. Elaine Barrier on behalf of Jerry.
Let us pray. O gracious and loving God, you send people into our lives for your purposes. And as we sit here in the quietness of your holy sanctuary, having named many before you, O Lord, we know that you have into your presence so many. But for those that we have named before you, we give you thanks for all that you have given to us through the lives of those saints we remember on this day. For generosity and mercy, for compassion and accountability, for all that the saints have done in our lives to allow us to be the people that we are today. We give you thanks and all the glory to you, O Lord, for all those that go unnamed on this day, but remain close to us and in our hearts and minds. And for those that are forgotten, who have no one to light a candle in the remembrance, we pray for and name in our hearts. We ask you, O God, that we may honor these lives as we go forth into the world serving and loving and holding up the values that each one of these saints has taught us. May these lights shine bright, not only for this time of worship, but also in the hearts and in the world as we carry on the task of being your saints here on earth. May your Holy Spirit guide us and help us to do that which is pleasing and acceptable to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel so that they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You are the one who shall command the priests who bear the ark of the convenient. When you come to the edge of the waters of Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, draw near and hear the words of your Lord your God. Joshua said, by this you shall know that among you is the living God who without fail will drive out from before you and the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. The ark of the convenient of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. So now to select 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. When Jordan... When the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan flowing from above shall be cut off. They shall stand in a single heap. When the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the ark of the convenient were in the front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So when those who bore the ark had come to the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, while those flowing toward the sea of Ereba, the Dead Sea, were woolly cut off. Then the people crossed the opposite Jericho, while Israel was crossing over the dry ground, the priests who bore the ark of the convenient of the Lord stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. God is still speaking. Well, as Gary mentioned, today is a busy Sunday. There is a lot going on in the life of the church. And first of all, today is All Saints Day, where we remember those who have come and gone before us. 
in particular those close to us who have died in the past year. And then we also start to think about our past as a church and those who have been a part of it over the years. We remember the lives, love, and labor of those saints with some sadness, much gratitude, and even a little awe. How did they do it? What must have been, it have been for them to keep the faith in Belmont, in Watertown, in all the places that we've come from, in their life and times? It's necessary to reflect on, not to idealize, but to reflect on the past and where we've been as a people and how God has brought us to this day. So today, we remember the past. But today is also Communion Sunday where we celebrate Christ's continued life among us. We come to this table for sustenance, for our daily bread, to encounter and embrace God's grace that is available to us in our present moments, here and now. We might not know or recognize or be able to see just how God's grace is at work in our lives at this moment, but we partake of this sacrament as an act of faith trusting that God is in our midst, even entering into our very being, so much does God want to be a part of our present life. So today, we celebrate the present. And today is also Consecration Sunday, the day of the year where we commit our gifts to God for the work of the church in the coming year. It's the day where we peer into that unknown future, acknowledge both the anticipation and the anxiety that comes with that, and pledge to be faithful to God through the life of this community. And that is also an act of faith, to pledge resources, which include time, talents, money, I said the M word, and prayer. Today we look to the future. So today is a full day of past, present, and future colliding. So when I looked at the lectionary text for this Sunday, I was drawn immediately to the passage from Joshua that Darby read. And my apologies, I picked the one with the hardest word of all of the passages I could have picked. But Israel is also at a moment where past, present, and future are colliding on the banks of the Jordan. Though their future, like ours, is unknown, they at least know where it is. It's on the other side of that river. And they know that because they have been here before. This is not the first time for Israel on the banks of the Jordan. A generation ago, Moses led them out of slavery, and they came directly to Canaan, the promised land. But seeing others already there, an exhausted Israel turned away in fear, ultimately resulting in 40 years of wandering the wilderness. So back at this moment, Israel, to get to their future, has to retrace the steps of its past. But it's not a glorious, poignant memorial like all saints. Instead, Israel has to pass through the very places where they were unfaithful, places they worshipped other gods, places of disappointment when they found out that others were already on the land they were promised, places where they retreated in fear instead of trusting in faith and following Moses' instruction. For Israel, at this point in the journey, retracing old steps, remembering the past, is a necessary yet sizable obstacle to arriving at a new and much desired future. But that's not their only obstacle. Israel is also under new leadership, Joshua. Moses, their beloved leader who led them out from under Pharaoh's grasp, who parted the waters and guided them to safety, who received the law and the covenant from God, who ensured their nourishment through manna and quail and water from the rock, this dear miracle-working Moses is no longer with them, as we heard last week, for this momentous occasion of crossing into the promised land. He has passed the mantle on to Joshua, who is surely known among the people, but he's not yet familiar, not yet totally trusted, because he is not yet 40 years into his tenure as their leader, or with much of a known track record for river crossing successes. Which brings Israel back to the present, the most obvious of obstacles, the Jordan River itself, deep and wide, overflowing, we read, at the time of the harvest, 
between them and their future. It's not a river they can cross, hopping river stones. It's too deep to ford. And unlike many a Hollywood action sequence, there isn't a convenient fleet of abandoned seaworthy vessels waiting for them at the riverside. Once again, Israel is at a daunting juncture. Their present, their threshold between troubled past and promised future is an expansive and fast-flowing river. No small obstacle. I don't think it's too much of a leap to make the jump between Israel's obstacles and some of our own at the moment. In recent years, and especially in recent days, our congregation has been painting a picture of our own promised land, a community that leads in vital, relevant, sustainable ministry, ministry that speaks directly to the needs and desires of our world, to be loosed from the power of addiction, to be nourished, body, mind, and spirit, to be a sanctuary, a protective place for the most vulnerable among us. In all of these and more ministries, we are witnessing to the power of God's love and grace at work in our lives and throughout this world. We have the vision. We can see the promised land. It's just right on the other side of a sizable river. Like Israel, we too have encountered some obstacles along the way to the riverbank. We have retraced our old steps. I don't mean in terms of remembering the past, but repeating it sometimes. This tends to happen especially around the difficult conversations and the sustainability aspect of our promised land. Well, you know, we've been in a place of not quite balanced budgets before, but we're still here, so, you know, we can do this again. Those are some old steps, some places we've been before. And those are places I'm sensing that we as a congregation are ready to move beyond. But it's still tempting to walk those familiar roads because they feel safe, even if they're not what's best. Old steps can have a mighty draw. And new leadership, that's something we too know a little bit about. I don't mean to draw any exact parallels between us and Israel, but it's true, we're in a leadership transition. Gary arrived here just as the work of Vision 2020 was concluding, this group who over the past year took stock of where we are and who we are and where we're going and came up with some recommendations, some river crossing strategies, if you will. And now we're all of us together on the riverbank, ready to dive into some critical work. At the same time, we're still getting to know each other. That can be a bit challenging, a bit unfamiliar, and it's okay to acknowledge that because we're all in this transition together and we know that God will surely lead us. But then there's a mighty river. And let me tell you, I've been on the path to ordination for more years than I care to mention, and I have thought a lot about the mighty river that we as a church, not only in Belmont and Watertown, but everywhere are facing. The thing is, our structures, our physical structures, our buildings, our bureaucratic and denominational structures, financial and administrative ones, they were built in and for an age that is different than the age that we are in today. That's not a value judgment to imply one age is better than the next. It doesn't even mean our buildings and structures don't still serve us well in some capacities. But it does mean that they are under stress. Or to put it plainly, maintaining these structures is stressing us. And when I stop to think about what's really stressful about that, or at least what's stressful to me, it's not so much that we want to preserve things the way they are for all eternity. That's not been my experience of the church. But rather, each of us have found things here within the church that have changed our lives, that have held us together through difficult moments, have connected us to a higher power, have sustained us through just another day, have taught us that we are loved with an everlasting love and impelled us to pass that message on. And those things that we deeply desire to pass on, those are the things that we want remembered at an All Saints celebration 50 years from now. And so what's stressful, what I fear in my less faithful moments, is that if we as a church don't figure out how to cross that river, we won't be around to pass this on. But then I look at Israel, this ragtag band of desert wanderers, this group of people who are still mourning the loss of their dear leader Moses, a group who could turn back and try their old steps one more time. 
Israel, whatever doubts they may have, whatever trepidation they might feel, knows the only way forward is through the river. And Joshua, whatever doubts he may have, whatever trepidation he may feel, knows that the only way forward is through the river. And so this time, they don't turn back. Israel abandons its old steps. God says to Joshua, this is it. This is your time. Follow my instruction, and the people will follow you. And Joshua does, and the people do. They trust God's presence, and they step out into the river. Last week, Gary's message focused on stepping out. If you were here, you remember he lined up all the kids at children's time on the edge of the chancel steps and had them, had them put their toes just over the edge and think about, visualize what that next step would feel like. What a powerful exercise to be ready to take that next step, to know what it would feel like, to be confident about what that will be, and yet to have to pause and think about it. I think for sure that is what Israel was doing on the banks of the Jordan. They'd thought about crossing and decided to cross. They lined up to cross and probably were thinking about what it would feel like to cross, especially those guys down front who knew their feet were going to get a little wet up at first. And then there's this pause. They can't all cross at once. They have to wait for everyone to line up for the waters to begin parting. And I have to imagine that in that pause, in that space before the step, there was a bit of a collective, what are we doing? What are we about to do? We are stepping into a river. Oh my God, literally praying now. Oh my God, what are we doing? But this is not an apprehensive, what are we doing? Or an indecisive, well, what are we doing here? This is an awestruck, what are we doing? Israel has committed to a bold future. They still don't know what that future is. They know where it is. It's on the other side of the river. And they know it's going to be bold because they are walking through a river to get there. And more importantly, they know to whom, to whom they have committed their future, to God and to one another. Because did you notice the howl of this river crossing? The priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, which is understood to be the throne or footstool of God. So God picture visually atop the ark. But with them are 12 men, one from each tribe. It's not just the priests, not just the Levites, not just the clergy who are leading this parade into a bold future. It's not even Joshua. Who knows where he is at this point? Somewhere in the middle, most likely. No. At the front is a whole lot of God and a little bit of everybody. And that is what will lead Israel to a bold future. Again, I think that's not a bad place to start if we want to draw some parallels. No matter if we here are in a time of transition, no matter if we have some doubt or trepidation about what's next, no matter if the river seems to be at its height of overflowing, we can trust God that our future is on the other side of it and that God will surely get us there. And we can also trust that God's plan is for us all to be a part of it. And that is very good news, especially in the face of anxiety is about striking out to a new future that might look markedly different from the past. It's hard for me personally to think about moving to new structures and new ways of doing things because I have reaped the benefits of the old ways. The church envisioned in another age has had a profound impact on my life and likely the lives of almost all of us. But the good news is that is exactly the part of the past that we get to take with us into the future. The people, all the people from every tribe with all of their collective and diverse memories and experiences and passions and gifts, all of them get to cross into this new future. All of us get to cross into the new future. God isn't going to leave a single one of us behind. Everyone is invited to be a part of it, even to lead in this river-crossing pilgrimage adventure that we're on together. And that is what stewardship is all about. It's 
not just about fundraising to fill gaps and balance the budgets, though of course balanced budgets have a great place in the life of the church. But stewardship is about saying yes to God and to one another as we step out toward an unknown future. It is pledging a part of ourselves for the journey. It is committing to that beautiful vision of a promised land. And this is not blind faith. We are able to commit confidently because we know God is at work in our past, in our present, and surely in our future. So let's line up. Let's go down to the riverbank together. And while we're waiting for everyone to assemble and for the path through the water to be made clear, let's have our own awestruck moment. Let's look at each other and say, what are we doing? And then step out confidently, trusting that a whole lot of God and a little bit of everyone will get us to the promised land. And to that we say, thanks be to God. Please stand as you're able for our hymn number 2195 in the faith we sing. In the Lord, I'll be ever thankful. This is a Tizé chant. We'll sing it through twice. <laughs> 